Hello everyone. So today we are here to talk about the chapter on personality, right? And when we talk about personality, right, one of the first things that we look at is how is personality defined? What exactly is the definition of personality, right? Now you might have an individual, right? Let's say their name is Ifat. Right, and if I were to describe Ifat to you know people in general, I would say that Ifat is you know she is moderately moderately um, outgoing, right? So she likes going out, but not all the time, right? Um, she is someone who is very punctual, right? She is very neat in whatever it is that she does. She's very thorough um, in whatever it is that she does. Um, <clears throat> what else? She is someone who is extremely conscious about her health. And therefore she likes to eat right. And um, she's someone who's very experimental with food, right, and with different experiences. So she likes trying out new food, right? Um, she's someone who enjoys doing makeup, for example, right, and meeting her friends. So this is what, you know, if it is basically like, if I were to describe her to people who do not know her, right, this is what I would say about her. Now, what is this? Now, when I say this is what if its personality is like, right? What am I really saying, right? When I say that she's, you know, moderately outgoing, right? That she's someone who's punctual, she's neat, she's conscious about her health, she's experimental with the sort of food that she likes to eat, she enjoys doing makeup, right? So what is this, you know? What am I really saying, what basically when I describe Ifat like this, what I mean is that all of these different traits that I have described here, right, they are consistent over time in the sense that it's not that I have just observed Ifat to be punctual once, right? It's something that I have observed over time, right? That um, she's not just punctual to, you know, sort of, um, you know, when she's going to attend class, right, but she's always on time for family events, she's always on time if there's a particular wedding, right, so it is a trait that is consistent, right, what that basically means is that it remains the same over time, right, if I say that she's neat, that doesn't mean that I have just observed, you know, her being neat, um, once it means that her room is you know almost all of the time it's clean right the way that she organizes things is very proper right so this again goes towards you know her trait being consistent right so that's the first thing that you know personality is made up of consistent traits so it's made up of you know consistency in you know, the different kinds of traits that you have, because, you know, when you look at these traits, not everyone might have these traits, right? And the other thing that, um, you know, sort of is very, very crucial when it comes to personality is something that we call distinctiveness. And what we mean by distinctiveness is basically what makes us different, right? Now, it's basically, you know, all of these different traits together, right, that make Ifat the individual that she is. It makes her very, very distinct. It makes her, it makes her different from other people, right? The fact that she likes makeup might be something that's common to a lot of girls, but the fact that she likes makeup 
and that she is conscious about her health and experimental with the kind of food that she eats right that she's also very neat she's punctual she's moderately outgoing you know this combination right of traits that she has is what makes her very very distinct there might be a lot of people who are neat but then there are a lot of people who will not have this particular combination of all of these traits coming together right so the first bit in personality is consistency that you know these traits that you have um have to be consistent and the other thing is that personality is what makes you distinctive or it makes you the individual that you are right so then the way that we define personality is that it is a unique combination or a unique constellation right of a person's consistent behavioral traits right what that basically means is that when we go back and we look at this example you know the fact that all of these different traits are cut together right in ifat right this is her unique constellation of individual of consistent behavioral traits right and this is what makes up personality now there are different researchers who have put forth different models of personality <clears throat> i'm sure that you guys have heard about um the five factor model of personality which is put forth by these two researchers by the name of mccrae and costa right and so this is what we call the five factor model of personality right because it is made up of these five different factors that according to mccrae and costa can sort of define right um any individual's personality so their unique combination in any individual can completely define that person's personality now let's look at what these five factors are so here in this diagram you see these five factors all sort of laid out for you right um so the first factor that we look at is something that we call extraversion or which is also known as positive emotionality right extraversion how will we define ext so extraversion is basically individuals who score high in this particular trait of extraversion right they tend to be outgoing they tend to be sociable right they are very friendly you know upbeat kind of individuals right so people who score high on extraversion tend to be you know outgoing they're sociable they're friendly they're upbeat right on the other hand when we have something like neuroticism here which is also known as negative emotionality what we see is you now what is associated with neuroticism is someone who is anxious someone who is hostile right someone who is very self conscious so they're very sort of you know um very aware of what they look like and they're very very conscious of the way that they appear to everyone around them right and vulnerable right so in some sense it's the opposite of being extroverted right so here what you are is that you're very anxious you're very hostile you're very self-conscious and vulnerable if you're scoring high 
on the factor of neuroticism, right? <clears throat> then you have this factor of agreeableness, right? Let's move to <clears throat> the slide here. So when you have agreeableness, what you see is that individuals who score high on agreeableness tend to be sympathetic, understanding, cooperative individuals. who are, you know, they're trusting and they are modest, right? So there's the sort of people who get along with other people very easily, right? So if you score high on agreeableness, then it's more likely that you will be more sympathetic, you'll be understanding, you will be very cooperative, you will also be trusting and modest, right? So you'll be someone who will be very, very easy to get along with for a wide variety of people. When we have openness to experience, now this sometimes, this factor of personality is sometimes correlated with a person's political views. And what you see is that someone who scores high on openness to experience usually has more liberal political views. Right? These sort of individuals are also open to a great variety of experiences. So they are, you know, individuals who score high on openness to experience are, you know, very curious, right? They're inquisitive. Um, they are also very imaginative, right? And they might hold very unconventional views. Right? So this is what openness is to experience is about. Now, when we come to talking about the last trait, which is that of conscientiousness, right? So what we see is that individuals who score high in this particular factor tend to be very punctual, very disciplined, They tend to be well organized. They tend to be people who are dependable. Right? So, this is basically what the five factor model is about, right? And basically, what you're trying to say here, we're using the five factors, is that all sorts of people, right, they will fall within these particular factors, right? In the sense that you will have a person, you know, even if they're, for example, not very outgoing, they will sort of fall, they will have some sort of value under the trait of extroversion in the sense that they might be moderately extroverted, right? If you go back to our example of effort and we look at these sort of traits that we talked about here, so perhaps what we can say is, you know, looking at the five-factor model, what we can say about Ifit's personality with regards to the five-factor model um, that we have, personality model that we have, is perhaps that she is, firstly, that she is conscientious, right? Because you have that she's neat, right? I talked about how she's well-organized, right? That she's punctual, right? So all of that sort of goes towards being conscientious. Right, then um, she is outgoing to a certain degree, so you know you might have that she is moderately, moderately, moderately extroverted. Right, uh, then you have conscious about her health. That could also go under conscientiousness. Right, um, then experimental with food. So this could fall under the factor regarding openness to experience, right? 
<clears throat> so you can also sort of think about your own personality and try to you know ponder upon you know how all of these different factors relate to your personality and where exactly do you fall with regards to this and what you see is that you know these sort of do um have some sort of <clears throat> influence on behavior as well obviously people who for example are very punctual who are very conscientious right one of the things that research finds is that such people tend to have higher gpas in <clears throat> both high school and university right people who are open to experience we've already seen they tend to have more liberal political views than those who score lower in the openness to experience right so yeah so all of these different factors of personality have quite a significant impact on personality <clears throat> but you know there is sort of um debate regarding how thorough this is as well right and this is when we come to talking about the different theories of personality that we have because we do have theorists who talk about you know the construct of personality and all of them have something to say about it right so we consider three different schools of thought um in this lecture the first is the psychodynamic perspective which is basically you know initially we consider the psychoanalytic perspective when we talk about the psychodynamic perspective and that is put forward by sigmund freud right and then we consider the work of everyone who came after freud so basically mostly his students right <clears throat> so this is basically psychodynamic perspective right which basically constitutes the work of sigmund freud and you know his students who went on to develop their own theories then we consider the behaviorist perspective right which looks at personality as sort of this cumulative this cumulation of response tendencies and this is mostly using the work of vf skinner and jb watson right <clears throat> last but not the least you come across humanist the humanist perspective and this is basically looking at the work of carl rogers and abraham maslow right so this is what these are the different perspectives that we're going to be talking about so let's look at the first which is the psychodynamic perspective <clears throat> so when we talk about the psychodynamic perspective we look at the work of freud and all of the different theories that have descended from freud and that mostly concentrate on unconscious mental forces right so the first bit of it is that these theories are descended from freud and they concentrate mostly on unconscious forces mental forces now the first of these perspectives is freud's own perspective which is the psychoanalytic perspective now freud was a neurologist and what he saw was that you know during his practice he observed a lot of different people who came forth uh, with some sort of mental illness right and he developed this very you know lengthy procedure which um, basically required a lot of interaction a lot, a lot of verbal interaction between um, you know the client and their psychoanalyst right or um their therapist as would be the language used today to you know sort of spend a lot of time with each other over a long period of time right and from his clinical practice basically he developed the psychoanalytic perspective and even though today freud's ideas are not very sort of you know they're not very well 
accepted but during their time they were very revolutionary and they were also very controversial so freud made three assertions what the first was that people are governed by their unconscious mind right the second was that you know a huge part you know personality is shaped majorly right by childhood experiences and basically how your parents you know deal with you when you were a child and the third of these was that a lot of your personality development depends upon sexual plus aggressive urges right <clears throat> now this obviously became controversial because if your mind if you if your behavior is controlled by what's unconscious right then that means that you don't have control over it because what ever resides in your unconscious you are not even aware of it so how would you be able to control it right which basically means that you are no longer master of your mind right this is the implication of you know freud's this first point that's put forward by freud right the implication of the second point which is that personality is hugely shaped by childhood experiences is that you do not control your own destiny you do not control who you become it's rather your childhood experiences right so you are not in control of your destiny right and the implication of the third is sort of that you know you're governed by your sexual and aggressive urges and this was obviously this did not sit well with the sort of conservative society that freud was a part of you know he grew up during the victorian era where you know sexual urges were repressed so you know all three of these assertions did not sit very well in society and you know freud was not only his ideas were not only rejected initially but they were also mocked and it was only with time that freud began to gain acceptance right and even now freud's ideas are ridiculed in psychology without sort of you know understanding that they were in um, you know their own way they were very revolutionary in sort of bringing to the fore this dialogue about the power of the mind right and also you know his discussion of the unconscious is also something that's very interesting <clears throat> so basically what freud's theory does is that it divides personality the idea of personality into three different parts right so there is the id right there is the ego and there is what we call the super ego right so according to freud the id is governed by the pleasure principle now what exactly is the pleasure principle the pleasure principle is that you know i want this and i want it now so it's basically you know the id is basically like a child it's basically you know you saying that i want this particular let's suppose car and i want it right now right it's like arguing with a 2 year old right um because a 2 year old will let's suppose wake up in the middle of the night and say i want an ice cream and i want it right now right and they will not sort of hear any argument because they're completely governed by the pleasure principle which is that you know i want it and i want it right now right 
So this is basically what the it is about, right? The ego, on the other hand, is governed by what Freud calls the reality principle. In the sense that the ego, right, is also looking for gratification, right? In the sense that it's also looking to gratify, it's also looking to sort of appease the demands of the it, right? But it's also in touch with reality. So if, for example, if your id, if your id says um, in the middle of the night that I want ice cream, right? Your ego will say, you know, let's wait till the morning, right? Let's wait a few hours. Or um, what your ego might might try to do is try to say, okay, so there's no ice cream, but perhaps there's something sweet in the fridge. So let's go look for that, right? So this is the reality principle in the sense that even though this is still trying to, to satisfy the urges of the id, it believes in delaying gratification till an appropriate time. Sorry about that. So delaying gratification till <clears throat> appropriate time. Right, so this is what the ego is doing, right? Now we come to talking about the superego, and the superego is basically all of the principles of morality, right, that an individual has, right? What does that mean? So basically all of the standards of what is right and what is wrong, right? And what is appropriate and what is not. So here we have this sort of example. So let's suppose you wake up and you realize that it's time to attend class, right? Now what your it does is that it says, you know, let's leave it. Let's sleep for a few more hours, right? Because, you know, obviously you, you want that sleep, right? And the ego tries to mediate, right? And the ego says, no, let's wake up right now and then we can attend class and we can sleep after that, right? And while you're sort of, you know, caught up in this conundrum, your superego is saying, it's very, very wrong to, you know, miss that class, right? Because your parents are paying such a heavy fees and you should not be taking your study so lightly, right? And then the ego is trying to mediate by saying, okay, so, you know, let's attend class right now and then we can sleep later, right? So this is basically how personality is operating according to Freud, that all of these different components of personality are doing something else, right? The id is governed by the pleasure principle, the ego is the reality principle, and it's also trying to mediate not just between reality and um, you know the wants of the id, but, but also between the superego, which is morality, and the id. So, you know, whereas the id might tell you that, you know, I want to sleep, the superego might say, you know, it's important to attend class because your parents have paid such a huge amount of money for you to get this education. And then the ego walks in and says that, okay, let's reach a compromise. Let's first take this class and then you can sleep, right? <clears throat> so this is what Freud's structure of personality is about.